And uh, I'm not into evil and torture and all that stuff. Plus, the Prince of Darkness should have sort of a distinguished look to him. And let's face facts, I'm no George Clooney. <laughs> you are listening to the Night and Day Podcast, featuring the interview archives of Western New York music writer Tom Jennings. Tom has interviewed some of the biggest names in music and entertainment, and now you can enjoy these never-before-heard interviews. Here is your host, Tom Jennings. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Night and Day. This week we have a doubleheader on tap with a couple of pretty amazing musicians. We have guitarist Steve Vai and drummer Terry Basio. And the, the tie that kind of binds them together is the fact that they both worked with Frank Zappa early on in their careers. And I think it was Zappa really that, that helped them both get their start. We'll talk with both of them about their time working with Frank Zappa. Terry spends a little bit more time talking about behind the scenes working with Frank Zappa and Frank's work habits, things like that. Very interesting stuff. Steve was coming to town as part of his 25th anniversary tour to support Passion and Warfare, his seminal album, an amazing album if you've never had the opportunity to hear it. As far as, you know, instrumental rock albums, it's it's right up there. Steve also went on to work with that great David Lee Roth band that featured Billy Sheehan, a Buffalo guy who's, you know, around where I live, Billy Sheehan is is quite the legend. And Greg Bissonette, who's currently playing with the Ringo Stars All-Star Band. And just just an incredible three-piece. We talk a little bit about Steve and the band's attempts to get together for a reunion show that around this time, I think last year, it was it was shut down because there was too many people that showed up for it. Uh, we also talk about one of my favorite rock movies of all time, and that is Crossroads. Not to be confused with the Crossroads movie that starred Britney Spears. And even though my nephew Joey is a huge Britney fan, uh, the earlier one starred Ralph Macchio. And it's just, it covers the legend of Robert Johnson and the deal that he made with the devil. And it's just a great, great, great movie. Vi plays the part of the instrumentalist for the devil. It's it, it just a very cool scene. Very cool part for him. We talk about the kind of different connections and, you know, even the fact that Vi for a long time was, was looked at as an antichrist. But you'll hear that in the interview, so I don't want to spoil that. So let's get started. First interview is with legendary guitarist Steve Vai. This is uh, Tom, Hi, Tom Jennings of the Niagara Gazette. Yes, I'm so sorry I missed your call. I don't know why my phone was not free, but uh, here I am. All right, well, no, uh, well worth the wait. So a uh, longtime fan, it's uh, quite an honor to be able to speak with you today. Thank you. Um, I, you're, you're getting ready for the uh, 25th anniversary of, of Passion and Warfare. Um, I guess, you know, throw a couple of softballs out at you because it's a piece for the show that's coming to North Tonawanda in the, in the Buffalo area. Um, why this album? I mean, I know the timing obviously is 25th anniversary, but uh, when did you decide that you were going to roll this thing out beginning to end? Well, you know, it's my seminal a recording as far as I think uh, most of the fans and the press are concerned and I always wanted to play it from the beginning to the end and I I love the idea of these anniversary kinds of things and I thought well if there's ever going to be a better opportunity to have an excuse to play this record from the beginning to end this is it so I embraced it and here I am yeah and I mean it really is an amazing album, and, and, and you know, I'm not just saying that because you're on the phone with me and everything, but I, I, I mean, but in pre preparation for this tour, did you go back and listen to it again and just go, wow? <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I just, <laughs> well, I mean, it really, and it's really held up well. Yeah, that's uh, surprising. It's, you know, it's hard because my perspective is that of the artist, you know, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate that I, I feel really good about all my <laughs> records. Uh, but this one in particular, yeah. Um, you know, when I when I recorded it, I didn't have any expectations because it was kind of different than what most people were classifying as um, uh, 
the instrumental guitar record, but I didn't think that way. I didn't even see it as an instrumental. I didn't, I didn't see it as anything except, hey, this is what I want to do. So I, I didn't follow any particular format. And uh, as a result, it was, um, it has a sort of a quirky little place in the uh, pantheon, I guess, of uh, instrumental guitar records. And uh, going back, and I didn't I only have to go back and listen to it, I had to go back and learn how to play it. <laughs> and uh, that was, uh, you know, when I got past the initial shock of it all, I realized that uh, I was certainly a focused, intense, um, you know, determined young man when I made this record. And it was filling my guts as bravely and uh, almost chaotically as I could. And when you go back and you see that kind of freedom in yourself that you had, it's inspiring, you know. I'm fortunate in that I, I carried that through my career. You know, I always felt like, why do something unless you're going to be enjoying it? Yeah, it, and, and I mean, I, I've read stories about how you fasted for 10 days when you recorded For the Love of God, and, and uh, just the whole recording process went beyond what a typical recording process might be. I mean, is there any other stories that kind of come back to, to mind about that period when you were putting this thing all together? Oh, yeah, there's a lot. You know, whenever you, whenever we go to create something, it's always kind of a reflection of what's going on with us at that time. And at that time, I was very into metaphysics and exploring all these uh, crazy things, um, numerology, astrology, uh, UFOs, and you know, all this kind of stuff. So uh, that kind of was flowing into the music. And, uh, you know, uh, you, you look back, and it's like a little snapshot of who you were at that time, and, and this record is, is pretty much like that. What was, what was the original question, though? Um, just, well, we, I was, the original question was just maybe some of the sort of the, the quirkier things that went on, like the, the story, the legendary story that you oh, yeah, fasted yeah, for God, 10 God. days. Yeah, so because I was in all this metaphysical stuff, I was doing all of these things that uh, people being basically prescribed in yoga books and meditation books and all that. And I built this pyramid that was in the, uh It was just made out of wood and it hung from the ceiling, but it was pretty big. And um, it had the same dimensions as the Great Pyramid in Egypt. And I sat, I, I sat under it and recorded a lot of stuff. <laughs> wow. You know, that's uh, yeah, that's there's really all sorts intense. of little... <laughs> Yeah, I never really, I never really told people that. I did back in the day, but it, it didn't stick with the uh, fast. Um, what else did I do? I wasn't very superstitious or anything like that, but uh, I was just intensely present as I was doing it, and that's about as spiritual as anybody can be, because that's when all the good stuff flows. So I didn't realize it at the time, but the thing that I was doing that had the most impact on the effectiveness of the music was I was completely focused on the music and following my impulses as they arose in the moment in creating whatever they fancied, so to speak. That makes sense? Oh, yeah. No, happy. Absolutely. And I mean, it's, um, it's evident in the record. I mean, there is that sort of, I mean, I hear those, those sort of those zap influences with the, the, you know, the spoken parts and all that other stuff, but from, a, um, I mean, I don't know, I hate to use the term controlled chaos because it's really not a chaotic record and there's moments that it's just so locked in. It's, it's amazing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it really, it, it really is just a, just more of a musical painting than, I guess that's the way I would describe it as a listener. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe so. Yeah, it was. Um, <clears throat> I think that was a result of. It, it, it's a very powerful tool when you don't have expectations. You know what I mean? When, when you're just doing something that just feels artistic to you, and and there's no limits really. Your imagination is your only limitation. So, I wasn't trying to fit in to a particular mold or 
perspective. And that was very freeing. So I think that that flowed into the music, and that's why it's it can be listened to today. And doesn't it, it really doesn't sound so... There's dated elements to it, you know, because it was in the 80s, and I, I did come from... Uh, being in these 80s rock bands, and there's certain aspects of it that have a quasi-datedness to them, but really not that many. I mean, it, it doesn't fit into a format. And that I, I just did unconsciously. And it almost seems weird in the sense that you were just coming off of spending time with the kind of, you know, I mean, David Lee Roth and that, that, uh, that just rock band, and in, in many ways was very formulaic, but yet it wasn't, you know, I mean, Roth is, it was, is known for being a showman and everything, but man, I mean, that, that band that he put together was just incredible. I mean, top to bottom. Yeah. We kicked ass. Yeah. And, and Billy Sheehan, you know, he's from out this area, uh, Buffalo. And uh, it's funny. I had a chance to interview him earlier this year because winery dogs were coming through and he told me a little bit about that show that the three of you guys tried to get together in LA and it was, it was shut down. Uh, by the, I believe it was the code enforcer or something. It was just the uh, the local uh, police, you know, um, uh, uh, whatever they call it, the people that come and shut down things. <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, did, did the th- I assume that that the four of you were able to at least practice or, or rehearse together, even though you didn't get to play in public? Well, we actually, we didn't, because we're only going to do two songs, and you don't really need to rehearse Shy Boy and, and um, Yankee Rose when you're Billy Sheen and Steve Barr and Greg this and that, and Greg, uh, Dave did want to run and listen to something, so he came over to my house beforehand, and we listened to it, and I played along with it, and, you know, he, he kind of prepared himself. Um... And the whole evening was very interesting. It was really a great feeling to be with the guys again. To feel that band community that we had so long ago, 30 years ago. And it was almost like vibrato bar interrupt us or something. Yeah. Because I was ready to, we were ready to just start. And, uh, yeah, they, they, they came and they told us that, they, that we couldn't play. Because it was just oversold. Yeah, and I mean, I, I've had the inter- chance to interview Greg and, and Billy and, and now you, and, and I mean, those two guys, just just incredibly musicians, incredibly humble as well, you know, just like yourself. And, and I mean, that combination, it, it just, I mean, it was pretty special. I wonder if there's ever going to be an opportunity for the three of you to play again, either with or without Dave. Well, you never know. I would certainly enjoy that because you're you're absolutely correct. Greg does net is... A drummer's drummer. I mean, the guy is so solid and on target and aware, and he could play anything, you know. And and Billy is is from another planet, you know. <laughs> his skills and his ear are, are it's just rare. This is very rare. I mean, if, if <laughs> no, I would go as far as to say that it's non-existent. Really, there isn't anybody that can remotely. That I know of plays like Billy Sheehan, you know, and I've got my quirkiness and a little bit of, you know, bizarre bend in me, and when the three of us would get together and, and, you know, play, it was pretty powerful. Yeah, I mean, on paper, that could have been a real recipe for disaster because you're all such, you know, like you said, you're all very unique players, and uh, for bands to really lock tight like that, I mean, it really was. Of, of that caliber, it's usually one or two of the guys that stand out, and somebody's kind of in the background. But top to bottom, that was uh, that was a pretty amazing unit. Yeah, we were lucky. The stars aligned. Um, I don't want to get too far off topic. I I, I kind of wanted to touch a little bit on a couple other things. Um, you know, I was first introduced to you through Frank Zappa, I had a, a good friend who was really into Zappa, and we sort of found you that way. And a lot of people know you through through Crossroads, and then other people through David Lee Roth Band. Um, if we could start with maybe Crossroads, because that was, I think, a real, real important musical memory for me. Um, what, what was, I mean, I mean, at the time that you took that part for the movie, did you see that as something that was going to help advance your career, or was it just, just something that you just took at the moment and said, hey, sounds like a good idea? Well, obviously, when, when an opportunity comes to you, a 
part of you says, you know, what what will this mean in the scheme of how I can continue working and how it might add to my cachet. And of course, that was there. But a bigger part of me says, I don't know what's going to happen with this film. It might end up on the shelf and nobody sees it. Um, I can't really expect it to do anything. But what I can expect is for me to do my best and to enjoy the process. And that's what I did, really, you know, in the moment. Hold on one, hold on one second. Go sorry. Go for Hello? Yeah. Yeah. So that's my next interview. So um, I can finish this question and maybe one more quick one. But okay. um, what, what was I talking about? Uh, crossroads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I just did my best and put my best foot forward. Um, and I was shocked at, at the impact it did have because film, you know, records are one thing, but film is another. All of a sudden, people recognize you. And to this day, people recognize me from that film. And it, it was a pretty big hit film, but not even a blockbuster or anything like that. So uh, it really had quite a supportive impact. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I realized that today when I was doing a little background research on it, you're born June 6th, 1960. So the 666 piece, was that, I mean, has there anybody ever made that connection based on you playing like, you know? Oh, yeah, there's people, there's people that, make all sorts of weird connections. There's this one very funny website that somebody put up on why Steve I is the Antichrist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and one of the one of the things they use is because I was born on six 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 and when I on six six sixty six I turned six. You know? Wow. Uh, it, it, it's all it's ridiculous. It's just numbers. So it, it, uh, as far as I'm concerned it doesn't mean anything. Um I don't know anything though. <laughs> yeah, well, I but, hope, uh, I'm sure that's yeah, all tongue in cheek for sure. Well, it's fear. It just it stems from people's fear, you know, and, then, and they, they do that with all sorts of things uh, that don't make any sense. And I just happen to be the target of a small group of fearful minded people. Yeah. Well, I, I know you've got your next interview to go. You know, thank you so much. I've had the blessing to see you as a solo performer. Amazing. But uh, twice with experience Hendrix and man, that, uh, that was a heck of a tour and, and you were quite a highlight uh, to those shows. And that was, that was quite a oh, thing. And uh, that G3. Well, if you album, get to see the Passion Warfare, if you get to see the Passion Warfare tour, it's really, it's the gist of me. Yeah, Steve Karras is such a great guy as far as a publicist, and I'm sure Steve will be able to hook me up with some media passes, and we'll put a concert review sure. for you and everything. So um, I think Steve probably took care of me the last time he came through, because I saw you at the Watership Music Hall in Rochester. I know you play a ton of places, so you probably don't necessarily remember that show. But, um, yeah, but anyhow, anyhow um, I, All right, well, I wish you the safest of travels, and I appreciate this time, and I look forward to seeing you in November. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Steve. Bye. Well, that was Steve Vai. Hope you enjoyed that interview. And now let's change things up and we'll shift over to Terry Bazio, the Missing Persons album, Spring Session M, one of my favorite albums of all time. The drum work on that and how they actually captured it as part of the recording is absolutely amazing. Missing Persons was never quite able to recapture that magic of Spring Session M, but it still stands as as a great album. Just listen to it from beginning to end the other day, and every song stands up. It's great. But anyhow, enough of me. Let's go to Terry Basio. Hello? Hello, is this Tom? Is this Terry? Yeah, this is Terry. I'm very excited to finally be able to chat with you. How you doing? Yeah, me too, man. Sorry I couldn't get to you. I was just finishing up my other interview, and the guy wanted station ID, so uh, I couldn't pick up. <laughs> oh, it's no problem. Yeah, the last time, it was, it was just one of those really weird occasions where I just was like, bam, bam. I don't normally try to schedule things too tight because I know stuff happens. I mean, it happens on my end, too, so... Yeah. But, well, no problem, man. I'm I'm glad to be able to speak to you today, and glad we were able to reschedule and all. So. Yeah, no, I appreciate. It. I mean, I've been a long time fan, a huge fan of UK, uh, Missing Persons, and man, I grew up listening to just a ton of Zappa. So, uh, you know, it's good stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, if we could start with, with Zappa, I, I know that, um, you know, you've probably been asked a million times because this year is that anniversary of the Beatles thing about about that. So, um, 
I, I, if we could start with Zappa in the sense that, that if you could tell me what uh, what impact playing with Zappa had in your career, like what kind of a drummer were you before Zappa and what kind of drummer were you after you, you stopped playing with him? Wow. I think I was a, a pretty good, well-prepared, uh, you know, up-and-coming jazz fusion kind of uh, drummer, but with rock roots. Uh, and then I had my uh, commercial music degree. I was classically trained, knew how to read, was exposed to uh, and, and playing classical gigs and studying classical music, you know, symphony and whatnot, with, uh, members of the San Francisco Symphony. So um, I kind of knew all the basics and was just uh, ready and raring to go. Uh, I had played with some great jazz musicians like uh, Eddie Henderson, Joe Henderson, uh, Woody Shaw, um, who all were uh, around San Francisco and, uh, you know, using using me locally. I had done sessions. Uh, I had played with uh, some local symphonies and, uh, you know, uh, was in several different bands and, and different uh, affiliations that were playing uh, different styles of music almost every day. I had a steady gig at the uh, Great American Music Hall uh, playing uh, in a big band, sight-reading charts and, uh, and uh, blowing free with uh, some really good players. I had uh, met and was very influenced by uh, Mark Isham, the film score composer, uh, who was a you know high school kind of college friend and uh, taught me quite a bit and helped develop my musical sensibilities that are to this uh, day uh, you know, uh, in good stead. And uh, I got this audition not really knowing Frank's music. So when I, I three days before the audition, uh, I, I bought uh, Live at the Rock Scene elsewhere, and it just blew my mind. I didn't sleep for three days, and I felt very lucky uh, to uh, have made the audition and uh, you know got in the band. And from there, uh, Frank Zappa, well, you know, to, to cut to the chase, he took took me as a unknown or you know kind of well-known local San Francisco drummer to uh, having world fame and the kind of credibility you can only have from having played with Frank Zappa or, or uh, Miles Davis or Weather Report or something, you know, McLaughlin, some of these, you know, great musicians uh, that, uh, you know, unfortunately those gigs, you know, just don't exist anymore for young kids. And, and a lot of the training ground for it, like when you think of, say, Maynard Ferguson, which Greg Bissonette, my friend, came up in, uh, you know, a lot of those gigs don't don't exist, and I, I feel sorry for young drummers who have talent and who have, uh, you know, above average, uh, you know, kind of ambitions to play something more than, you know, a beat, you know, a backbeat or something, and, uh, you know, they, they have no place to go, so, uh, you know, they could help them, and so that was like a, a windfall for me. You know, from that, I met Eddie Johnson, I, you know, uh, was asked to replace Bruford and Holdsworth in that band. Uh, you know, I met Warren Cucurullo, who was a fan of Frank Zappa, and we formed Missing Persons later. Uh, I think uh, Jeff Beck, Jimmy Page, all kinds of people saw me play with Zappa, and then I ended up playing with, uh, you know, with Jeff, and, uh, you know, David Bowie saw me play with Zappa and asked me to play with him, but I, I think I was trying to do a solo thing at the time. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it was just like Marine boot camp for uh, a musician. He made me play things that I had, that were way more difficult than anything I had faced uh, in classical music in college. And um, he pulled things out of me and gave me this experience of uh, what the road life is, how to survive on the road, how to not, uh, how to avoid the pitfalls that, that kill Hendrix and so many of these great musicians, uh, how to, you know, have fun, uh, how to, for, for instance, I didn't know I could sing and play, you know, and uh, he had me playing in 5-4 and singing, wind up working in a gas station, and I realized that from my jazz listening development, because you're playing complicated stuff and you're listening to a complicated saxophone player as if you're playing it you know, yourself, uh, that that ability was able to be translated into being able to sing and play at the same time, and probably into the ostinato thing, you know, to, to be able to, uh, you know, hold down uh, a groove and uh, and solo against it. So, you know, 
it was a very, very rich experience, and nobody would know or care who the hell I am if it wasn't for Frank. And uh, he's definitely the most, uh, one of the heaviest, you know, people I've ever met. Um, just in terms of that impact, uh, when you feel some presence that's just like, holy cow, you know, he, he, he's at the top of the list. Uh, Nicholas Leninsky, a great musicologist who Frank also knew, uh, had, a, had a death I felt as well. Uh, and Robbie Robertson had a whole different kind of death that I felt uh, upon meeting him. Uh, and there's been many um, that, you know, that I've met um, that, that have that depth of soul to me. But Frank is probably the most, you know, multi-talented and intelligent and funny guy, <laughs> you know, and gifted and, and, you know, he's a great guitarist. Any one of the seven things he was great at, uh, you know, writer, band leader, rock star, guitarist, uh, classical composer, uh, businessman, uh, he could have made a, a career out of him and been very successful. And he had all seven. So that was Frank, man. And now, uh, I mean, after him, yeah, I learned I learned a lot, you know. I learned how to project to uh, the guy a quarter of a mile away at the other end of, a, of an arena in the cheap seats. And, uh, you know, he, he brought out all that crazy stuff I did, you know, with titties and beer and punky's whips and being that, uh, that character uh, and playing the drums in that way, which <laughs> the fashion was sort of heavy metal. So, you know, we went for that... Uh, to that angle of it and um, yeah he, he really uh, pulled a lot of great things out of me and I had a lot of fun and really learned so much yeah, I mean, it's funny you mentioned titties and beer. You mentioned a lot of things. I wouldn't even. I mean, I could go off on about thirty-five different tangents, but uh, yeah. Yeah, titties and beer. I mean, just such an iconic song, you know. And and I, I didn't really think about it in the context of music at the time. But you're right. In in many ways, Frank's music didn't fit in a particular era. It was just Frank's music. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he really drew from everything. He made fun of everything. He used everything, um, and and he was constantly, he was like a sculpture, you know, with some wet clay. He was constantly tweaking it and making the nose a little this way or the ear a little more that way, you know, what happened. Every day was a rehearsal, uh, every sound check, and every night we were playing new parts uh, to uh, arrangements in different tunes. It was just a constant development, and it was 24 hours a day, and you had no other life. And, you know, when you're young, and you don't uh, have, like, permanent relationships, sort of. You know, that, that, that lifestyle worked just great for me. I mean, I, I made, I think I made seven, 750 bucks a week on the first tour. And then he put us on like a year retainer. So he said, you know, I figure we're on the year, uh, you know, on the road half the year, and we're off the road half the year. So I'm just going to pay you 400 bucks a week, and that's what I got. And you can scale for any recordings and stuff like that. And believe me, man, it wasn't about the money, <laughs> yeah. you know. But uh, you know, when you think of like a college scholarship or something, you know, I, I learned so much being around that guy. Phenomenal. You know, and, and this is this is a off the off the Zappa topic uh, a bit, but you know, after that, you know, you transition at some point, you get into into UK. One of the things that's always confused me about UK is that, in reality, you had some incredible players and musically superior to Asia, but yet Asia kind of takes it and just sanitizes it. And becomes commercial. Was were you at all frustrated with that? I mean, there, I mean, and I like Asia, I do. And but but to me, when I listen to UK and I listen to Asia, it's obviously, I mean, UK is it's 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 you. You don't have. To, does that make sense? Uh, I mean, I don't have those feelings. I love John. I, lo I think he's a great bass player, great musician, and a great songwriter. And then his voice, I still don't think has been recorded like I've heard it live and it's just you know goosebumps on the back of your neck he can do things uh, that that's I don't know just he's got a you know sonic personality that's really wonderful and a history you know behind him with Crimson and all that stuff so you know he's amazing and Eddie is quite a genius you know he's a 
genius composer. He, uh, I mean, I, I didn't really get him that well in Zappa, but when he, you know, we went back to England and we were playing a week at the Hammersmith Odeon or something, and uh, Ed came by and, and played us the new UK tape. Here's my new band, Frank, after leaving you. And, uh, you know, we were all impressed, Frank included. So uh, I was really happy to get the call from them. And then, uh, you know, uh, I was sort of a sideman in that band. It was Eddie and John were the direction, and uh, they were really open to my ideas. And I, I was a little, I, I wasn't really a, um, a yes or a uh, uh, ELP fan. So, you know, I didn't, uh, you know, not that it's bad music, it's just not my taste. It's not something that moves me, you know. So, uh, whereas, say, I don't know, Genesis I really liked. <laughs> I don't know why. So, uh, and, and still continue to like Peter Gabriel. That just, you know, is more the direction I'd like to, would have liked to have gone. So, when when uh, you know we kind of had a falling out, and I decided I wanted to uh, uh, to miss some curses. I wanted to do something more modern and trendy, and, and uh, you know new wave, uh, but with good players. So that's that's how we left. It was really my desire to do my own thing, and missing persons was the next you know the next step in that direction. So when Asia. Uh, formed and and had the success. I just heard John's voice leaping out of the radio and felt this is great. You know, I love the guy and you know, good for him. You know, he's making it. And um, you know, I don't particularly listen to that style of. Uh, you know, I suppose now we would call it what progressive corporate rock or something. I don't even know what you call uh, it. <laughs> it's like a yeah, pro yeah. progressive pop, I guess. Yeah, but you know, that's that was the game, and you got to play the game. You know, so missing persons was was okay. Here's the game, and here's the parameters we want to work within. So how can we be as creative as possible in those uh, parameters? And uh, you know, John's just a guy who this music flows out of, and uh, you know, that's that's. I mean, from way back, you know, to something like Fallen Angels, King Crimson, which is gorgeous, to uh, to anything he's done with Asia or the latest things, it's always just kind of John. That's his heart. And I feel he's a pretty authentic person, so I don't I don't feel, you know, as much as, uh, you know, like if you're talking about baseball teams, you know, you're behind the Giants instead of this team or something, you know. I don't feel that way. Uh, I just feel like it's just John's soul and his journey, and, and that's what he's doing. But, uh, yeah, you know, UK didn't have that much commercial success, and uh, I suppose that was a disappointment at the time, but, uh, you know, not after. And we had a great reunion uh, a couple of years back, and that was fun to do, and the music really holds up, and, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that uh, whatever business or personality things between me and Eddie, uh, we just can't seem to get on the same page with it, but... Uh, I'm, I am looking forward to the Brenner Brothers Heavy Metal Bebop Band this uh, July uh, in Europe. So that could turn out to be maybe one one of the final, you know, collaborations that I've done in my past that could turn into something that uh, every once in a while we could continue to do that and remain friends. Because Randy's, you know, a jazz guy, and Barry Finnerty's been a friend since I was 16, you know. Great guitarist from San Francisco, you know. Uh, and Neil Jason is a very funky bass player, and uh, so you know I think uh, there's some good potential there. And I'm always open for anything, you know, so, as long as it's a kind of a fair deal that I feel I can relate to and, and give myself to 90 percent. Because I, I just I can't do anything halfway, you know. I, I couldn't play for somebody I, I, I don't really feel their music, and, and even though the money might be gazillions, you know, if I don't feel that authenticity or or some connection there, I, I just can't do it. You know, it's not about money for me. It's more about, you know, what's the right thing for me to do uh, in a certain situation that, uh, you know, uses what it is that comes from inside of me. So, so yeah, you know, I'll, I'll probably never be rich, but uh, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I had no idea that you and uh, Eddie Jobson weren't uh, communicating, but I, I don't know. I guess it's not worth. Well, you know, the same thing, different day. You know, it's a yeah. kind of a personality clash. Uh, you know, Eddie, Eddie's, you know, band is UK, and uh, there's just no room for anything else but uh, what Eddie and John do. 
so you know John's happy because he you know he wrote uh, all the lyrics and the melodies and stuff and uh, and he feels that's his part in it and uh, you know I'm happy because I played the drums and I wrote the drum parts and you know and all but uh, when it comes to the business dealings there's this uh, control and uh, lack of transparency that's just always gotten in the way with with Eddie uh, so unfortunately you know if I don't if I feel I'm not being told the whole story or something like that, then I start to lose my faith and trust. And there's a part of me that has been taken advantage of so many times in my life, you know, in the music business, that uh, <laughs> I just can't do that anymore. And so I don't want to set myself up to be disappointed. So uh, that's where we left it. So I think he's, you know, using other great drummers, some of the greatest drummers that are alive playing now, and, uh, you know, going on, and he's either calling it UKZ or whatever. Uh, and more power to him, because he's a great musician, great composer, very creative guy, and I respect him uh, musically uh, a whole lot, in, in spite of our disagreements on certain business things. So, yeah. Well, I, I know you touched on missing persons, and uh, I mean, Spring Session M, uh, one of the things that, that has always stood out about that album is how you captured the, the drums. <laughs> I mean, they are so, I, I mean, as far as the drums in the mix of a studio recording, I don't know of any other where they are just so good and so in your face that you just can't ignore them, even more so than something like Rush, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, let me tell you why, and I'll tell you another record where that same thing happens, Billy Cobham's Spectrum, ah. okay? You hear every freaking note, and that's because of my good friend and one of the best engineers that ever lived, Ken Scott, you know? He worked with Beck, he worked with Elton John, Supertramp, David Bowie, you know, the Beatles, he was a tape op for the Beatles and just the nicest guy you'd ever want to meet and he loves recording drums and we did that big uh, it's like a big sample thing of all the great drummers he's worked with with uh, uh, David uh, David Bowie's drummer um, Dixie Dregg's drummer uh, Rob Morgenstein uh, myself uh I can't remember all the rest of the guys that are on there, but all these great drummers he's worked with. And uh, we sampled, uh, resampled, and recreated uh, some of the stuff off those records. And uh, and it's available, so you know, composers who aren't drummers can uh, have my old Missing Person sound if they wish. And then it was the Roto Toms and, and uh, his, whole, his whole approach to music. He's such a perfectionist, and, uh, you know, we... Uh, God, I, I learned so much from being with him. That was really a great experience, too. And, and he, you couldn't find a better person on the face of the earth. He's just one of those uh, wonderful guys that is still one of my dear friends. I think he's living in Nashville now and plugging into that. So it be interesting to see what comes out of Nashville under the Ken Scott uh, sonic personality. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, it, I mean, I listen to a lot of recordings, obviously, because I write about music and everything, but it just, it's, it strikes me how how little attention is paid sometimes to just the drum sound. And I know I used to read, especially in the 80s, where, you know, your studio time sometimes would just be eaten up trying to mic the drums properly and get a decent sound. And, you know, when you have those moments, like you said, with Billy Cobb and with yourself and whoever, I mean, they, they really do stand out. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's uh, it's hard. Studio time's expensive, and drum miking is very complex, and it has to do with each individual, their equipment, and the room that you happen to be in. You know, um, different engineers hear different things and want different sounds, and we were very lucky. I mean, Ken, Ken is one of these guys who's like a doctor with the greatest bedside manner. When he played with Tony Williams on, uh, or recorded Tony Williams on that uh, Stanley Clark album, I think it's called Born to Love or something to do with love. But at any rate, Tony Williams plays on there, and the sound is great. And Tony Williams, Ken said, you know, I, I need to take your front bass drum head off in order to put, you know, this RE20 uh, electro voice his classic bass drum mic in inside the bass drum and muffle it and get the sound and uh, that will record well and Tony said well you can do that but I won't be able to play it because I'm used to playing with two heads on my drums and I, I just can't you know can't go there with this muffled 
you know, single-headed bass drum. So Ken <laughs> figured out, okay, if I take the drum apart, take all the lugs off, and screw in some wires, I can suspend the uh, the mic inside, and then uh, you know, run the cable through the you know, decouple the the Canon connector, and then solder it back up once it's inside the drum. So the the cable goes through the vent hole and put Tony's drum back together. So he just loved the way it felt and was able to play and uh you know he, he's done that with so many people uh, just just how how can we make this work you know i was having trouble with uh, one or two tracks with missing persons um because uh you know my symbols are kind of spread out and i was doing these big kicks that are off the, the beat and uh the bass drum uh was like a four on the floor type bass drum and I was pulling the time a little bit every time I'd reach over, you know, to, uh, to play these uh, offbeat cymbal crashes. So he said, why don't we do, uh, make a loop of, of the bass drum, and, uh, and then you can just play the top part of the kit. And because I knew my drum parts so well, I did that, and that's how we recorded it, you know, to make it perfect, because, you know, you need to make uh, commercial music uh, have that, that perfect time. Uh, another thing he did was uh, when we made our first demo up at Frank's studio, Frank was generous enough to, he said, well, you can come in my studio, you know, and help me get the bugs out of it. And, uh, you know, I trust Ken Scott. He's, he's great. And uh, once you, you know, make a little demo and stuff while I'm on tour. So we went up there, we start recording and everything. And, um, you know, we're playing to a click and the tunes just don't lift the way missing persons uh, and, and natural music wants to lift, but they've got to be perfect because it's the 80s and it's, you know, click track uh, central. So, <laughs> so Ken had a box built that was a programmable click. So things like uh, Destination Unknown and Mental Hopscotch, Walking in L.A., were all recorded with this programmable click that when you went to the course, it, it, it sped up a, a, a BPM or two. And uh, and then when it came down, it maybe just went down one, and then it went up another two. So the tune was constantly moving forward and had this excitement to it that is built in natural music. If you listen to Tony Williams, you know, like, uh, he, he's playing the head at a certain tempo, and then, you know, the head ends, and Miles is going to take the solo, and it just rushes forward, and it's so exciting. And I came from that school, you know? So uh, when when uh, you have to be saddled with a click, uh, it's, it's kind of like no fun, you know? It's like walking with tar on your foot or something, so... <laughs> So uh, at any rate, uh, Ken would, would work around these problems technically to make what we wanted happen. And uh, he was just such a great guy at, at doing stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, the, the, the end product was, you know, amazing. It's, it's one of my favorite. I'm walking in L.A. I mean, just that, that's just, a, I mean, they're all great songs, words, destination unknown. It, it really does hold up very well. Thanks. Um, and just a final question because I've, I've taken a lot of your time and I really appreciate it. Um, you're coming to Buffalo, a little place called Nietzsche's and everything. This is this is a solo solo show. Can you just tell me kind of what this this? I mean, you said you're doing the Brecker Brothers thing and 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 whatnot. But what are what are your solo yeah. shows like? What do fans? What can they expect in this? Uh, for the show well it's it's going to be uh i mean anybody who's seen me play will will know you know that it's that it's kind of what it is i do uh those who haven't seen me play are in for a big surprise um i have a huge drum set it's all tuned pitch perfect and it's uh it doubles uh midi notes that are that reinforce the melody so you hear real notes i have eight different bass don't uh bass drums tuned to the eight you know, eight different pitches, so I can go from an A to an E to a G, what have you, and uh, you know, make bass note changes. I accompany myself with uh, uh, either musical or rhythmic ostinato patterns, and then solo against that. So it's almost like a piano player playing a bass line with his left hand and uh, soloing against it with his right hand. Then I've got my artwork. I've, I've made a stage set out of four of my paintings, and I'll be bringing that to create some atmosphere. And uh, it will be an evening of music on the drums, which runs from uh, some things may be a little bit uh, like modern classical music. Some things may be ambient and spacey. There's a lot of different colors uh, orchestrationally between all the percussion instruments I have on my kit and uh, the way I use space. 
And then, uh, you know, I have uh, quite a few pieces that uh, I, I play, and every night, uh, you know, I play whatever the, the piece is, the composition as is, and, and it, it always has improvisation in it. So, you know, uh, a certain tune may have uh, a certain groove, an ostinato pattern. Let's say it's an ethnic pattern from Africa, and then there's a scene at the beginning, and uh, and then there's some improvisation and uh, musical development, and then it may return to that scene. So it's, uh, you know, like songs, real music that played on the drums. It's, it's pretty unique. And, and my drum set, I would say, you know, with the Guinness Book of World Record crap aside, <laughs> is the largest tune percussion uh, and drum set uh, in the world that's practical and being used by uh, a well-known drummer. You know, like most of the guys in the Guinness Book of World Records are just kind of collectors and assemblers in order to get their name in that book. Uh, I'm really not about that, and I, I call my drum set, <laughs> I refer to it as the circus act, you know, because it's it's kind of hard to get past the size of it and the sculptural aspect. It's really a beautiful piece of sculpture as well. And uh, But it's it's my, my instrument, and I need, you know, if you're going to play melodies, you need notes. So if you have a cymbal that has an interesting sound, I need eight of those in order to you know, play melodies on that sound. And if I have tom-toms, I need whatever, 20 or something to, you know, to have enough notes to play uh, the melodies I want to hear. And to keep the variation, you know. I could play on a three-piece kit, but then you'd hear the same notes in the same intervals uh, all night long, and that wouldn't work. So uh, I have very varied and contrasting types of uh, tunes that I play and some special surprises and uh, you know most people will uh, just go on the time traveler trip with me I, I think from my father I inherited this ability to go inside and take people on a trip with me and I don't always know where it's going to go and that's a good thing because it's usually better than something I might force with my will so uh, I just you know, I've prepared myself with compositional techniques and, and knowledge of improvising in a compositional manner. And I've done my homework with, uh, you know, permutations and rhythms and coordination. And uh, I go out there and I see what develops out of, uh, you know, using everything I know in the moment. And some people say it's spiritual. Some people uh, get the mood and see, you know, um, film scores or you know they think it's like a film score to a movie in their head and uh you know uh i'm grateful that they feel that way that's kind of how i feel uh, you know a two-hour show can go by like that and just go wow it's over you know yeah. <laughs> and uh doesn't feel like it was two hours so uh yeah but it, it is definitely not a bombastic Gene Krupa like drum solo all night. It's uh, moods and colors and uh, scene changes and, uh, you know, loud and soft and fast and slow and high pitch and low pitch and uh, this sound and that sound and all kind of, all the variations of, of real music uh, are there. So, so that's what they can expect. And, um, God, man, I love Buffalo, man. You know, I love all... <laughs> I love all those freaking north, uh, you know, northeastern towns that have become the Rust Belt. You know, it's like yeah. such beautiful old infrastructures up there, and the people have always been great. And uh, I hope you all come out. And, and there's a great, uh, you know, kind of artistic tradition up there too. So uh, I hope you guys will all come out and enjoy the show. Yeah, you're not far from the place you're playing. Is not far from the Albright Knox Gallery, our our main. Uh, like art gallery that's got some mm -hmm. got some incredible stuff. I saw a special. I saw a special on that. It was wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great place. My son goes to college right across the street, and he's and he's a drummer. So, um, you know, this this will be a great evening for him as well. So we're really looking. Nietzsche's is a Nietzsche's is kind of a I don't know, man. It, it's a cool little room. I mean. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's the best way I can describe it. it. It's got a lot of character. It's not one of those, you know, brand new things that just has no character. And even, you know, they throw stuff on the walls to try to give it character. I mean, it legitimately just has character. <laughs> it's just kind of a cool place you know, to man, see a show. As long as, it's got a, as long as it's got enough space for me to set up, which I'm sure it does, uh, I, I'll play anywhere, you know. 
thought, I, I, my setup now includes a, a Line 6 mixer and, you know, this MIDI, MIDI reinforcement and uh, uh, Line 6 uh, speakers. So I, I'll have my own sound on stage everywhere I go. And uh, they can, you know, they have the choice of, of micing everything and, you know, putting that out through the PA system or and or including my uh, on stage mix but I've got it sounding pretty good in my little uh, office at uh, drum workshop there and uh, you know I think uh, no matter where I play now it's going to be real consistent I, I had maybe a couple of bad nights in, in Europe out of a whole you know 20 day tour uh, that were just uh, clubs where it, you know they were so small and we were on a budget and you know rather than lose so many hundreds of dollars a day you take a gig that's low paying and they instead of being 50 people seated it's 100 people standing and they're right up against your bass drums almost muffling it just sucking all the sound out of the room I had two of those experiences in Europe and that's the only time I ever had uh, you know bad nights in terms of it being hard for me everybody loves it you know that that's all, always the case I'm so grateful to report but uh, you know for me personally it makes it very difficult to hear you know the, the sound of the drums in the room coming back at you and I can uh, you know uh, synthesize that now you know with this this mixer it's just so great it's digital it's programmable you can you know like if my bass drum is tuned to an E and uh, maybe in that room you just don't hear that frequency you hear some other frequency and it makes the drum sound out of tune I can just EQ the frequency of that particular low E and goose it and then you get the note that you want and I've done that and it's pretty much tuned the same way every day and stays pretty much in tune so it should be a good uh, a good tour I'm really looking forward to it yeah a lot of dates I mean you know it's uh, it's pretty amazing. You're you're doing. It seems like you're doing a ton of travel and a lot of days off. You know, man, this year is it's the 50th anniversary of my first drum lesson, July 15th, uh, 50 years ago. This is my first drum lesson. I got a practice pad and sticks and a couple of books, and, and never looked back. You know, <laughs> so uh, I. I I realize at 63 now, you know, I'm in good shape and I want to play the drums and have that kind of experience and fun and share with others as much as I can before I die. You know, I don't really care about money as long as I can survive and play and do, do what you love to do. Uh, that's kind of the reward in, in and of itself. So, uh, you know, I just want to play before my body says, Terry, <laughs> you know, your knee or your back or your wrist or whatever won't let you do this anymore. So, uh, and I mean, you know, Casals was playing cello at the age of 90 and was, you know, probably better than he ever was. So I hope uh, in music uh, I can, uh, you know, do something like that. Yeah, Ringo's still doing it, and you know, uh, funny because I just met, well, I just interviewed Greg Bissonette for the second time, I know you mentioned him earlier, but yeah, Ringo at yeah. 72 is just a freak of nature. I mean, he doesn't do the whole night, but man, he still plays. Yeah, Ringo's a great, a great, uh, well, I mean, you know, that's that's why I went and got my first drum lesson. <laughs> I saw Ringo on freaking uh, Ed Sullivan's show, and, uh, you know, yeah, it was, uh, you know, I mean, the Beatles were an amazing uh, phenomenon of our time. And Jen continued. We have a friend, a real close friend of mine, Jim, who lives uh, in my, my little town of Camarillo, California, uh, is a huge Beatles freak, and he's constantly playing that stuff. And they're, they're re-releasing things that I forgot. And uh, I, you just go, oh, my God, I forgot they did this song. And, oh, man, that one. You know, and listen, this is like a classic country tune that they wrote back in the 60s whatever and uh, and oh listen to the changes on this and listen to the mood you know of, of this tune they're you know really great uh, great group yeah in six and in six years they they put out that you know and in six years they put out yeah. more stuff than bands will do in 40 you know it's incredible yeah yeah I mean that that's uh, yeah the other amazing thing about it all you know just I don't know yeah, I mean, we, life. we could talk about that for forever for sure but hey man yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know what a great honor thank you so much I'm glad this all worked out and said I'll really look forward to uh, to seeing you when you come out here and when the piece goes up yeah. it'll be a little closer to the uh, 
it'll be a little closer to the date and I'll make sure that you get a copy of it and all that kind of good stuff. Great, great, great. And please come by and say hi. And uh, yeah, I look forward to coming up here. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Terry. Thanks. All right. Hey, okay. Thanks so much Bye. for taking the time. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right. I'll just wrap up by saying thank you for listening to Night and Day. This was a particularly long episode. So if you made it to the end, I really appreciate it. And if you have the opportunity to post a review of this podcast on any of the podcast platforms, Stitcher, iTunes, or however you're listening to it, I would certainly appreciate it. We'll keep the episodes coming as long as you keep listening. And this is Tom Jennings saying, I'll see you at your next concert. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.